القائد الأعلى المسدد نقوض معارك ناناهم وسنمضي جموعا نردعهم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته أجمعين وبعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Are there some sisters here? Good. So my respected uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, um, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a manner which is uh, befitting his stature. And we remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his malaika, they send special salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us, all you who believe, you too should send salutations upon him with a sense of reverence and gratitude. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamin indika hamidun majid. Allahumma barak ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamin indika hamidun majid. After this, my brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to discuss today some issues relative to correcting our behavior, reforming ourselves. And I titled this presentation as The Enemy Within. Because many Muslims today, they are preoccupied with the enemies from without. And they are pointing the finger and they are blaming and they are analyzing and they are scheming and they are plotting and they are reacting to the enemies on the outside while they are subject and subordinate to the enemy within. And if we are unable to subdue the enemy within, it will not matter what our assessment is and what our efforts are to deal with the enemy from, out, from the outside. The enemy within is the unruly self, nafsi ammara. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, none of you can become a true believer until you bring your hawa into accordance with what I have brought. Your hawa, your opinion or your desire or your feeling, your emotion into accordance with what I have brought. So we know that the believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last day, it is their obligation to check themselves, control themselves, 
bring their opinions and bring their feelings and bring their emotions and bring their desires into accordance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In the light of the present world circumstances and the many adverse situations that Muslims are facing every day, in so many places, one can rationalize and understand why our minds would focus upon the nations and or governments that are directly or indirectly responsible for perpetrating such adversity upon the Muslims. Of course, it's natural. It's natural for us to be preoccupied. It's natural for us to be concerned. It's natural for us to react to the enemies who are perpetrating this kind of adversity upon Muslims everywhere. As a reaction to, to these criminal acts against Muslims, we are seeing an equally blatant amount of criminal acts perpetrated by Muslims as reprisals from groups of frustrated and angry Muslims who believe that they must fight fire with fire. We see other Muslims marching, shouting, publicly protesting, in an attempt to peacefully or in other ways bring attention to these horrendous and unrelenting acts of aggression upon Muslim people. They feel, and justifiably so, that this is the least that they can do in facing the onslaught of an obvious enemy. This social and political repression and oppression has created a host of complex and unprecedented reactions and have led to the extreme behaviors of hatred and vindictiveness on, many, on the part of many Muslims. I do not personally justify these extreme behaviors on the part of Muslims, whomsoever they are, how justified they may seem, how noble their objectives may appear, how knowledgeable they may be. Because criminal actions and criminal reactions are both all criminal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor do I in any way or shape or form justify the criminal behaviors and aggressions which have provided these or prompted these reactions. What I do want to speak about uh, this morning is another enemy that in my estimation is equal if not greater in its threat and impact upon the Muslim and the Muslim society, which is usually avoided in discussions and which is sometimes veiled by other emotional issues, the enemy within. This enemy is a veiled enemy. This enemy is an enemy that we don't look in the face, except if we look in the mirror. This enemy works from within the ummah and within the individual. And this enemy destroys the ibadah. And this enemy distorts the aqidah. And this enemy gradually displaces the energy and the direction of the in individual who has this enemy within. This enemy works from within the ummah and therefore its influence is double-edged. And it is very blatant and it has a very serious psychosis attached to it. One, this enemy serves to aggravate and distort the relationship between Muslims even. And number two, this enemy serves to distort and undermine the Islamic message and the Muslim image to the non-Muslims. This enemy has several faces and this enemy has several features, some of which I want to discuss. Some of the characteristics and features of this enemy stem from lack of knowledge. That's number one. 
If we trace the history, the Islamic history, we'll find that immediately after the Prophet wasallam, there appeared some Muslims who although they appeared to be muttaqi, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, it was mentioned about them that they prayed more than most other Muslims. They engaged in more ibadah. They recited more Quran. They were more fervent in their spirit and their nature. But over a gradual point of time, they misinterpreted some ayats of the Quran. And they misinterpreted some sayings of the Prophet wasallam. And through this misinterpretation, they began to cause aggravation among the Muslims. And eventually this aggravation led to not just blaming other Muslims, but it led to their pointing at other Muslims and calling Muslims kafirs. And inevitably, after that, it went to the furthest extreme where they started to make it halal to take the blood of other Muslims. How this happened? One simple thing, to their lack of knowledge and their misapplication of some of the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through some extreme behavior, Another feature that this enemy takes is that as a result of anger, as a result of blaming, as a result of criticism, as a result of frustration, it leads them to aggression. And this aggression is a criminal and an immoral behavior. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I think the Imam recited it the other, the other day, or someone recited it, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Sibab al Muslimu Fusukun wa Qitaluhu Kufr. To abuse a Muslim, to curse a Muslim, is a fisk, a criminal act. Wa Qitaluhu Kufr. Fighting him, killing him, is an act of kufr. Another one of the features that this enemy takes is extreme behaviors and views. Extreme means a behavior or a view which is not accepted, a behavior or a view which is not recommended nor documented by the majority of the Muslims and their scholars or a behavior which we did not find the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approving of. Something simple as anger. Anger is one source of extreme behavior. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to a person whom he found angry? What did he say to him? Three times. La taqdab. La taqdab, la taqdab, three times. Don't become angry. Don't become angry, don't become angry. And another hadith he mentioned about this anger, that the anger is something from the shaitan. You can see the signs of the anger when a person becomes very angry, what happens? You see the heat from the shaitan comes up in his face. You see the heat of the shaitan comes up changes the disposition of the person, clouds the intelligence. And in a fit of anger, a person might smash something, might divorce his wife, might hit his children, may kill somebody. Out of what? Temporary madness. Because anger, anger is a temporary form of madness. It's a source of extreme behavior. Extreme views, adopting a position about matters in an extreme way. That is, rather than take the middle course or the moderate course, the person he takes an extreme course. The message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was once, and I just want to summarize this, he was once uh, approached by three men who themselves thought 
that they were expressing some action of extreme religious behavior. And one of them, he said, I will pray and I will pray continuously. And the other, he said, I will fast, I will not break the fast. And the other said, I will have nothing to do with women. All of them thought this is an act of zuhud, you know, extreme uh, uh, religious or ritual. And in the modern world, we think that these kinds of people, it is some sort of indication that they have done what? Committed themselves to some high level of worship. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to them? He said to the first man, I pray and I stop my prayer for my needs. I fast and I break my fast. And I love women. <laughs> Subhanallah. Whoever is not of me, uh, and whoever, this is my sunnah, is it, is it correct, Akhi? For man ragiba an sunnati, falaysa minni. So whosoever gives up my sunnah is not from me. Here the Prophet ﷺ was trying to show these three men who were exhibiting very proudly extreme views to do what? In order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is rejecting those extreme views. We have among the Muslims many, unfortunately, many, especially young men who are adopting extreme views. And they are thinking by that that it's a sign of religiosity. It's a sign of taqwa. It's a sign of loyalty. In fact, they are misrepresenting the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They are misrepresenting the Muslims. And they are causing aggravation throughout the world among the Muslims and outside the Muslims. And this kind of extreme behavior, this, these extreme views lead to extreme behavior. Another one is ethnic grouping and prejudices. How the Muslims naturally, it is natural for me and it is natural for you to want to eat the food of the people I was born amongst. It's natural for you and I to wear the clothing of the people I'm born among. It's natural for you and I to speak the natural language which I'm born among, to have a feeling for my people of the geography, of the ethnicity where I'm born. This is natural. And this is why nationalism and tribalism, this is why it's an imperceptible disease. It's like the gas that comes from the stove. You can cut that gas on and go to sleep and you will not see the gas, right? Isn't it? You won't see the gas, but maybe you won't wake up. Because it's an imperceptible disease. It's an imperceptible poison. Nationalism is natural because it comes from a natural source, the love of self, love of people, concern for self and people. Some people call it patriotism. But it leads to extreme behavior. The Prophet ﷺ, he condemned this kind of behavior. And it starts from an innocent way. You enter the masjid and you look to sit with the people from your place. Me, I'm African-American, African-Caribbean, whatever we want to call ourselves, Afro-Australian, whatever. So here I'm looking for Afro homeboy. I see one in the masjid, oh, subhanAllah, keep I keep, mashallah, where you from? Then we sit down together. We talk our homeboy language. So every time I come to the masjid, I look for him. He comes to the masjid, he looks for me. It happened innocently. What happens? We start to group ourselves and we also look for other brothers in Australia. Aki, you know any other brothers from America? You know any other Afro-Australian uh, Afro brothers? We start to want to eat in our own homes. We want to eat chicken. Because it's what we like. We start to grouping and then after that, we start seeing some other groups, some behavior we don't like. And the same thing happens with the Pakistani, and the same thing happens with the Indian, and the same thing happens with the Afghani, and the same thing happens with the Arab, and the same thing happens with the Lebanese, and the same thing happens with the Somali. All of them do this innocently. But what did the Prophet ﷺ do 
with his companions when, he, when they arrived in Medina Munawwara, what did he do to modify this natural tendency? These were Arabs, but some was Muhajir and other was what? Ansar. The Prophet ﷺ, he put them together as brothers. So they share the same food. They sit in the same place. They discuss with each other similar conditions. He did this, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as a wisdom to modify that natural tendency. And they were Arabs, but they're just from different places. We also, brothers, have to be very careful of this ethnic grouping and prejudice because ethnic grouping leads to prejudice and bigotry. If you don't sit with others in the masjid, if you don't walk with others, if you don't invite others, if you don't answer the invitation of others, you will not see them as your brothers. You will see them as outsiders. Once you see them as outsiders other than yourselves, you will prefer yourselves over them. And shaitan will come in between you and them that you're sitting on this side and they're sitting on that side and sometimes they think they don't know why you're looking at them that way. And they will think the same. And at times your culture will clash. And then there will come some behavior will come and someone will call the other one, you black so-and-so, or you stupid packy, or you this or you that. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say to Abu Dharr? when he said something like that did he say may your face be covered may your forehead be covered with dust or something like that Ya Abu Dhar you have uttered something for a speech of the Jahiliyyah and on, the, on that Abu Dhar he reformed himself and he called that person whom he said, said that word to and he apologized and he put his head on the ground and told that person Bilal radiallahu an put your foot on my head. So we too, we have to, we have to kill this issue before it rises up. Because it is one of the most destructive elements among the Muslims. One of the most destructive elements among the Muslims. Yet, it is something seemingly it is tolerated. And is passed down from grandfather, to the grand, to the, or to the, to, to his son, to the grandson. And that you will find among the Muslims this disease and they don't even realize the disease exists. And we find it among the Muslims in the form of what we call cultural baggage. Baggage that we carry from wherever it comes from. And we bring it right inside the religion. And when we teach other people the religion, what do you think we also teach them? The cultural baggage also. And it distorts the brotherhood. It undermines the brotherhood. And it distorts the image of Islam. Another one of those characteristics is ideological polarization. Now, what does this mean? That is, among the Muslims, they take for themselves certain ideological positions, whether it be madhhabi positions or whether it be other ideological persuasions. So, one man says, I am Hanafi. I don't pray with the Hanbali. I don't follow the Hanbali Imam. I go to a mosque who is Hanafi because it's binding on me to follow my madhhab. What has he done? He has polarized himself. And this is what has happened to the Muslims to such a degree that it was not just long ago, not too long ago, that even in Mecca, at the Kaaba, what were the Muslims doing? When the Adhan was called, what was they doing? The Hanafis was praying behind, and Hanafi Imam, Maliki behind, Maliki Imam, Shafi'i behind Shafi'i Imam and the Hanbali behind Hanbali Imam. How many years ago this was? 25, 30 years ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the individual who sparked a call to eradicate this. 
May Allah reward them. Can you imagine the reward for the person who brought up this issue and made a call for its destruction so that today when the Muslims go to Mecca, whatever you want to say about the government there, whatever you want to say, when the Muslims go to Mecca today, is this existing today? No. When the Adhan is called, they will pray behind one Imam, MashaAllah. Look at the situation in the world today among the Muslims, in every country, in every place. Not only now is there's madhab now, but you got the different persuasions. Some people, they don't want to sit with, they don't want to pray with, they don't want to go to a masjid with groups of Muslims who are outside of their persuasion. So some people said, I am Salaf. Alhamdulillah, all of us, we want to be Salaf, inshallah. Because who are the Salaf? They are the best people. They are the three generations that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he guaranteed that they are upon guidance. Three generations guaranteed upon guidance. Qarni thumma yalunahum thumma yalunahum. His generation, then those that follow them and those that follow them, they are under guidance, and surely they are under guidance. Although there are some differences in issues of fiqh, they are under guidance. So those are the salaf, and all of us we want to follow the salaf. But it doesn't mean that because I take that name for our group and we name this masjid, Masjid as Salafi, Masjid as Salafi, it does not mean that we are Salaf, we are the Salaf. It only means that this is what we prefer, we call ourselves. And that's okay to call yourselves whatever you want. But it doesn't make you better Muslims than another group of Muslims because you took that name. Otherwise, some people call this uh, Masjid Quran. What better name is that? Masjid al Sunnah. What better name is that? But it doesn't make those people there what they say it is. It's just a name they took. Alhamdulillah. It's a good name. So you and I should not take a name for ourselves and adopt, because of that, some polarization against other Muslims. Because what will happen is you will refuse to be with them and they will refuse to be with you. You will blame them, they will blame you, and there is the farq is there. The division is there. Shaitan, he has conquered. No matter how righteous you think you are, how righteous they think they are, Shaitan has won because he has created a division between you and your brother. When the Imam, when the Iqamah is called, what does the Imam say? Astahu. I'tadiru. Straighten your ranks. Close the gaps. Shoulder to shoulder. Feet to feet. If you straighten your ranks, Allah will straighten your hearts. And Allah does not look to the ranks which are what? Crooked. Inna Allah yuhibbu alladheena yuqatiluna fi sabilihi safan ka'annahum bunyanum marsus. It's an undermining of brotherhood. It's an undermining of the ummah. It's an undermining of our mission to take positions of polarization in ideology. No matter how righteous it is, you have to find a way to tolerate your Muslim brother. What about the companion who came to the Prophet Wasallam? the man that came to the Prophet Wasallam, and he asked him, and I don't know the exact narration, maybe the Sheikh can tell me, he said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi our Imam, we believe our Imam, he, he is a fasiq. Should we, uh, should we pray behind him? He said, Aw qama qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, prayer is incumbent upon you behind every Imam. Whether he is good, he is not good. For if he is good, the prayer is for you and him. And if he is other than that, then what? The prayer will be for you. So we don't look into the masjid and see who's leading the prayer. Uh, the, or that imam, he smokes cigarettes. I ain't praying behind him. Or this imam, he's a Hanafi. Or this imam, he's this. Or this imam, he have this view or that view. As a brother, he asked me yesterday. One brother asked me yesterday. He said, Akhi, you, yesterday, you were saying that we are lucky to have a mufti in our midst. And that we should 
come to the masjid and sit with him and ask him the questions. Don't ask me. That's what I told the people. Why are you asking me questions of fiqh? You have a mufti here. He just led the salah. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know. Don't ask me. I'm just one of you. I need to ask. Some things I think maybe I know. Some things I suggest. Some things I give my opinion about. Some things I'm following. But I'm not of the Ahl al-Dhikr. You have somebody there. So the brother said, yeah, but Shaykh, you know, uh, he have some uh, crooked ideas about this and about that. I said, subhanAllah, akhi. Uh, do you ever get do you ever become ill does your wife become ill your children become ill he said yeah I said do you take them to a doctor yeah do you have children he said yes he said, where were they born he said inside the church the hospital oh so they were they were your, your, that somebody pulled your child out of the womb of your wife they put their hands up inside your wife pulled the child out did you know the aqidah no you didn't you go to the dentist, you know his aqidah? No, you didn't. Did you ask whether he's a Muslim or not? No, you didn't. No, you went to them for a need. And you didn't care whether they were good, bad, homosexual, kafir, nothing. Just you wanted to do what? Relieve the situation. How we go to kafirs every day to relieve our situation? And we're talking about a scholar who has something wrong in some ideas. What scholar is ma'asum? Is there any of them? Only Rasulullah sallallahu and the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they said we take and we leave from everyone illa Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the only person who is ma'asum. He's the only one whose person, whose words, as Allah subhanahu wa taala said to us, "Wama ataakum al-Rasul, fakhudu, wama nahaakum an, fantahu." We take from the scholars of Islam what they have to give us and we understand that there may be some deficiency from where they took from. There may be something better from where they took and we do what the ulama did. We do what the mujtahideen did even among themselves. They took from each other what they found to be sound and later if they found something which is better than what they took from that person they replaced what they found which was better, but they did not make slander upon that scholar. How, what will be our condition? If we found four scholars in, in Australia, four major scholars here, and we found four of them good, but none of them is perfect. And so when we put them under examination, we found some faults in each one of them. So we said to each one of them, we're not following any of you. So what we will follow then? You'll follow someone less than them. And when you find that person which is less than them, if you examine him closely, what will you find? You'll find some faults with him too. You go to his house, you see something in his wife, his wife doesn't dress right. Or you go to his house and you, you, maybe you hear some music playing from his television. Or you follow him around and you find this or you find that, or you heard he bought a car from Riba, or you heard or this or that. So what will happen? You don't follow him. So then you will follow somebody what? Less than him. And who will that be? Until you will follow a fool. Or you will follow yourself. And this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned to us that a time will come when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will remove the knowledge from the people. How will he remove it? He will take the people of knowledge away. So that when the people of knowledge is taken away, or they are ignored, what will the people do, do then? They will choose the ignorant people and they will seek the knowledge and get fatwas from those ignorant people and those ignorant people will lead them astray. What has happened to us today? We have to have respect for the people of knowledge. Whether they are ulama, fuqaha, or students of knowledge, we have to have respect for them. Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave us so many hadiths about the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of those who pursue the knowledge and the obligation upon us to follow the people of knowledge and to seek from them resolutions, answers for our problems. And knowledge should never be the source of Muslims 
boycotting other Muslims or having polarization against Muslims. That should never be the issue. If anything, knowledge should heighten the tolerance. It should make us more patient. It should make us more appreciative of each other, more tolerant of each other's position. Then there's the issue of intolerance and intemperance. <coughs> Muslims arguing with each other, calling each other bad names, boycotting each other, threatening each other, castigating each other. Today, subhanAllah, go to the internet. Go to some of the Muslim websites. Muslims saying worse things about other Muslims than you find the Kafir saying about the Muslims. Yes, I have heard some things that Kafirs said about Muslims on their websites. Very blatantly, but it's ignorant. You can excuse this. This is a Kafir. He doesn't know us even. So if he doesn't know us, we don't care what he says about us. But you go, there's some websites you can go on yourself today. Maybe you saw them. And Muslim brothers are slandering major scholars, saying they are deviants, and even in some cases, they are kafirs. Subhanallah. How the level comes like that? After we slander the scholars and the students of knowledge, who, is, who else is left? Who else is left? We have to have patience. We have to have appreciation. We have to have tolerance with each other in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An Abi Amr, Waqila Ami Amra, Sufyan ibn Abdullah radiallahu an qal, Qutu ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kulli fil Islam, Qawlan la as'alu anhu ahadan ghayraq, Qal, Kul amantu billah, thumma staqim. On the authority of Abu Amr, and he is also known as Abu Amra, Sufyan ibn Abdullah, radiallahu an, who said, I said, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell me something about Islam which I can ask of no one but you. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Say, I believe in Allah, thumma staqim. Say, I believe in Allah, and therefore, after that, be upright. It's the issue of conduct. Say, I believe in Allah, and then do what? Be upright in the conduct. Be straight in the speech. Be honorable, be dignified. And if we're not honorable and dignified towards the Muslims, who will we be, we be honorable and dignified towards? Another issue is bad planning and disrespect of time. The Muslims are developing a reputation that about the Salah, they are very uh, um, uh, 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 particular. I mean, even you see now some clocks in some certain masjids, they have it like to the minute. They are looking to the clock, looking to the clock, looking to the clock. When it reaches that minute, click, stand, pray, let's go. Very, very particular. But about other matters, paying the debt, respecting uh, uh, the time, meeting someone when they say they're supposed to meet someone, starting something on time when they're supposed to start, don't care. About issues of dunya, issues of trans, uh, transactions, issues of human relationships, issues of social relationships, issues that are just as important, they don't care about the time. But inside the masjid, when we're doing the rituals, very important about the time. I was in a masjid in London three weeks ago. And a man, he told me that I was not allowed to pray in their masjid if I wiped over my socks. SubhanAllah. If I wiped over the socks, I cannot pray there. He told me, take your socks off and wash the feet, otherwise you should not enter the masjid. He's an old man, what can I do? So, Alhamdulillah, in London there's plenty of masjids, so okay, I don't want to argue with this man. So I left that prayer in another place. 
What do you think I find? After the salah, one day I came to the same area. This man, he has a shop downstairs. He's selling haram. Subhanallah. What kind of thinking is the Muslims? He tell me I cannot pray in the masjid because I wipe over my socks. He's downstairs selling fawahish magazines, cigarettes, uh, uh, what you call it, the lottery tickets. And he's got a picture of the Kaaba over top of the, the shelf there. I said, subhanallah. Also, lack of order and cleanliness. Lack of order and cleanliness. Simple issue, brothers. And brothers, look, we can all get better. This is not a criticism of you. It's a criticism of me. Criticism of us, the family. My advice to the brothers, wherever you have a place that you worship and that you gather, you have to appoint some brothers and some sisters whose job it is every day to look, to clean, to wash, to wipe, to put the shoes where they're supposed to be. If you got windows, wash the windows. If you got a lobby, mop it, sweep it, make it smell very good, make it very attractive. Why? Because this is not your place. It's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do you know something? It's unfortunate that the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually does not look like the house of the Muslims. The Muslims will take care to shampoo their rugs, to clean their windows, to make nice curtains, to clean the bathroom. Why? Because some guests will come. They will do this. The wife will be working busy to cook good food and everything, all that. But for the masjid, just we open the door and we go inside, we throw our shoes in the front or whatever it is. And after the salah is over, we just go back out and come in and out, in and out. Subhanallah. No, brothers. My advice to you, and again, I don't want anybody to think I'm talking about this place. No, I'm talking in general. The Muslims should take care about the houses, where they, places where they gather. That the places where they gather should be cleaner, more attractive, more orderly than any other place in that neighborhood. The outside of their place, if there's a sidewalk, every once in a while, steam clean it. Remove the, the bad smells. Remove the discoloration. Wash the windows. Make it so that when people pass by the Muslim place, good smell. It is distinct, it is clean, it is orderly. And the reputation, if they never come inside, the reputation that they have for the Muslims is what? Their place is always, always absolutely clean. And if they enter your place one time ever, they don't know what you talk about and what you do there. What's their impression? Everything is always in order. And what does it take? You assign four or five young men, Young boys, four or five older ones to supervise them, and two or three to supervise them. And what is the job? Their job is to spend 30 minutes a day cleaning the toilets, cleaning the hallways, cleaning the outside, cleaning the windows, sh shampooing the rugs, fixing the books, putting everything in order, making sure that everything, and reminding the brothers and sisters when they come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a place for their shoes. There is a place for the shoes. I see it right there. Isn't there? On the top shelf, on the top, in the top there, isn't there a place? Is the shelf there? What's the shelf there for? And you have another one downstairs on the, on the way down, isn't it? What is it for? It's for the shoes. My suggestion, brothers and sisters, when you enter the masjid as a respect, put your shoes on the place which is designated for the shoes. Why? Because if there's a fire and some smoke just fills up this place here and the shoes are all cluttered in the front there, what will it cause? Fire has it. Some people will get trampled. So if it's nothing more than that, removing something injurious from what? From the path. And so each one of us can do a good sunnah that when we enter the masjid, if we see the shoes scattered, we should make them orderly. And put them on the shelf. So when a brother, he, gets, he comes to the masjid and just kicks his shoes off, 
He comes back to look for his shoes. He sees them on the shelf. SubhanAllah, how do they get on the shelf? So after a while, he will get the picture. He will get the idea, right? They didn't just get on the shelf by themselves. Someone put them there. So after a while, what will happen? Very rarely will somebody come to the masjid and kick their shoes off. They will put the shoes on the shelf. Something very simple like that. Narrow-mindedness about other cultures. The Muslim is not narrow-minded. The Muslim is wide-minded. He's tolerant for all kinds of people. Whether they're from Australia or they're from China or they're from America or they're from the Antarctic or wherever, even if somebody comes and he's to say he's a he's a he's a he's an alien. He that's his ET. We are tolerant to meet him, talk with him, be patient, to listen, whatever his situation is. You remember that Arab that came inside the Prophet's masjid and what did he do? He urinated. Right in front of everybody, because he's ignorant. Just, can you imagine that? A man, he just walk in here. We're all sitting here, and he just walk over there and urinate. Some karate brothers will go beat him up. The Amir will say, no, don't do that. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't do that. Just put some water on it and see what's going on with him. He, he must be ignorant. Something's wrong. Sit him down. Maybe he comes from a place, maybe he's from the bush. Maybe he has a situation of incontinence, right? He cannot hold his water. You don't know what his situation is. Put some water on it, sit him down, and talk with him. Be patient with him. We cannot be narrow-minded against other people in other cultures. We have to be wide-minded, patient, tolerant, until people understand and appreciate and become knowledgeable. Then they will change their habits. We have a problem in adopting other people's values and traditions. And what I mean by that is that Muslims start to take the values and traditions of others and hold them to be more important than the values and traditions of Islam. Muslims, is more, more, it's more important that they are accepted to be Australian or to be American or to be British. To be accepted. More important than the, for them to practice the sunnah. More important for them than to read Quran or to pr perform the Salah. A man will get up in the morning, 7.30. He's late. He usually leaves the house, 7 o'clock. So he pours the coffee. He lights his cigarette. He rushes to catch the bus or to get on the, get, uh, to get on the highway. To do what? To get to his job. But he didn't pray Salat al-Fajr. And even if he does pray Salat al-Fajr, he doesn't mind, he doesn't care that he didn't pray it inside the masjid. What has happened there? The tradition and the values of the place where he is and the issue of dunya and what he needs from it has become more important to him than Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Thinking that the religion is separate from academics. There's a name for this in Arabic, I can't think of it right, this it means secular. No, this is extremism. To be secular, the people who are the Ilmaniya, see? The Ilmaniya people, who think that there's a separation in the religion from the issues of knowledge and academics and the deen. And they separate the religion like that. This is academic and this is religious. And the two don't have anything to do with each other. And this is like saying, this is for me, and this is for Allah. It's no difference. This is for the religion, and this is for the mundane life. And they don't separate, keep things separate. So the kuffar, this is what they live. They said, the separation between what? Church and state. The Muslims, they say, separation between what? Masjid and my mundane affairs. Another one of the characteristics of how the enemy comes into us is losing the respect for leadership and organization. Today, the Muslims don't mind to gather on Jum'ah. The Muslims don't mind to gather on Eid. The Muslims don't mind to gather for the Salah. And definitely there will be an Imam to lead them in the Salah. 
But what is the duty of the Imam? Is the duty of the Imam only to lead the Salah? Is duty of the Imam only to perform marriages? Or to advise the people about divorce? Or to talk to the people about Zakat al Eid? Only to talk to the people about fasting? Or to recite the Taraweeh? This is the only thing? Or to give the khutbah on the uh, Salat al Jumu'ah? This is the only responsibility of the Imam? This is the only respect that he has? What about if he orders you something which you don't like? Does he have that right? Of course he does. I think it is an athar of Umar al Khattab that he said there is no Islam without jama'ah, is it? And no jama'ah without Amir? And there is no Amir unless he has what? Amr, huh? Three things. And the Prophet ﷺ said, follow my sunnah, and what else? The sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin Mahdiyin. So the sunnah of Umar radiallahu an, he took it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no Islam without jama'ah. What is jama'ah? Jama'ah is the organization of the Muslims. Of course, the, the greater jama'ah is the jama'ah following the Quran and the sunnah. The minor jama'ah is the jama'ah of the Muslims behind an Amir. And of course, there's some disagreement whether we could call the Imam of a group Amir or not. But there has to be a leader. And that leader has to be obeyed. And he does not, he is not just obeyed in matters of rituals. No. He's obeyed in all issues unless he's ordering you something. As in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is no there is no obedience to any creature when it involves what? Disobedience to Al Khaliq. But if he orders you a thing which is difficult for you or that you don't like, you must follow the order of what you like and what you dislike and do as much as you can. then there will be organization because there will be respect. And if you don't respect your leader, don't expect anyone to respect you. And don't even expect that when your children grow up, they're going to respect you. They won't. Because they will see that you yourself have no leader. Why should your son follow you except while he has to? No, there has to be leadership in Islam. There has to be accountability in Islam. There have to be discipline in Islam. There have to be organization in Islam. Because when you can organize, you can plan. When you can plan, you can predict. And this is where we are being beat. All over the world in planning and organization. Because the unbelievers, they are following their leaders. We Muslims, we have to follow our leaders. Ati Allah wa ati Rasul. وَأُولُوا أَمْرَ مِنْكُمْ Finally, circumventing the responsibility of da'wah. Circumventing the responsibility of da'wah. That is making excuses. Thinking to ourselves that the people who are responsible to give the da'wah are the imams, the scholars, the students of knowledge. Those are the people who give the da'wah. I don't have to worry about the da'wah. If there's somebody interested in Islam, I bring them to the masjid and tell, ask the imam, Imam, can you talk? This is a friend of mine. Or we think that the person who should give the shahada to someone is the priest, the imam, the scholar. Who said that? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Balligu anni walau ayah. Preach from me and teach from me whatever you have. Even if it's only just a verse. A verse. Just a saying. Preach from me. He said in the final khutbah, Let those who are present convey what I have said to whom? To those who are absent. Our responsibility, you and I, is to understand the religion to the best of our ability. Pursue knowledge. Act upon that knowledge, invite towards that knowledge, and after that have sabr upon the adha that will come from propagating that knowledge. This is our obligation. 
The Muslim who circumvents this or neglects this is blameworthy. Because he or she, either they're lazy, they just don't want to give dawah, or they become like the Jews. They want to keep the treasure for themselves. Nobody wants to invite nobody to the religion. The Jews don't invite anybody to their religion. And some Muslims, they do not give any dawah at all. They talk with Muslims, they eat with Muslims, they, 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 they stand with Muslims, but they don't give any dawah to non-Muslims and they don't invite them to the masjid and certainly they never invite them to their houses. Where they get this sunnah from? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to answer and respond to the invitation of the non-Muslims. When they invited him, he, came, he went to the invitation. Unless there was something in that invitation which he was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to do, not to go. He went. Even we found in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu he went to the house of a Jewess. And at that place, he was poisoned, wasn't he? This is very significant. How he went to that house. He's not a Muslim, eh? And ate their food. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to save the Prophet sallallahu that he did not swallow it. He went to the invitation and he invited. Many places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yas'alunaka in the Quran. Who is he speaking with? Who is, who is asking? Yas'alunaka. Many times those who's asking, they are Yahud or they are Nasara. Or they are pagans. They are asking the Prophet ﷺ this question and that question. How are they asking him? They are asking him outside the masjid? Standing in the street? No. Whenever they came to the Prophet ﷺ in his place, he let them come, sit down. So the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he had tolerance for them. And he created an atmosphere that made it easy for them to ask to be answered. And the Prophet ﷺ, it was his habit to go and make his visits and his rounds and talk to people. Our duty is to do the same. Convey the da'wah. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to read to you just a few hadiths from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ to support some of the issues that I brought up to you and they are very small hadiths. An Abi Dharr, Jundub ibn Junada wa Abi Abdul Rahman Muad ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhuma an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal ittaqullah haythu ma kunt wa tabi'i as-sayyi'a al-hasana tamhuha wa khaliq an-nas bi khuluq hasan رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن وفي بعض الشيخ الحسن الصحيح في بعض في بعض النسخ is it نسخ نسخ on the other side Abu Dhar رضي الله جندب ابن جنادة and Abu Abdul Rahman Another name for Mu'adh in Jabal radiallahu an. May Allah be pleased with both of them that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Fear Allah wherever you are and follow up a bad deed with a good one and that will wipe it out. And then after that, behave well towards people. It was related by At-Tirmidhi who said it was a good hadith. And in some copies of At-Tirmidhi's collection, it was said to be a good and sound hadith. عن أبو هريرة رضي الله عن أن رجلا قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أوصني يرحمك الله أوصني قال لا تغذب فردد مرارا قال لا تغذب رواه البخاري on the authority of Abu Hurairah who said, 
a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah or he said please counsel me he didn't say in this hadith Ya Rasulullah he just said counsel me and the man and the Prophet Sallallahu said to that man do not become angry the man repeated his request several times and he the Prophet Sallallahu said do not become angry. This was related by Al-Bukhari. And the final hadith I want to share with you. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, An Abi Hurairah radiallahu an qal, qal Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, min husn al-Islam, al-mar'u tarkuhu ma la ya'ni. On the authority of Abu Hurair radiallahu an, who said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, part of someone's being a good Muslim is his leaving alone that which doesn't concern him. In the very easy language, to mind his business. Don't inquire about things that don't concern you. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليقول خير أو ليصمت ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم جاره ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم ضيفه Rawah al-Bukhari wa Muslim on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu an that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said let him who believes in Allah and the last day either speak what is good or keep silent and let him who believes in Allah and the last day be generous to his neighbor and let him who believes in Allah in the last day, be generous towards his guest. Dear brothers and sisters, these are some of the faces and features of the enemy within, which if we are honest and objective, represent an equal or greater danger to Islam and Muslims. By discussing these characteristics, I am not blaming or criticizing anyone. Rather, I am identifying illness in the Muslim body, of which I am a part of. I am doing exactly what a physician should do when he examines a patient. That is, he makes an assessment. He makes an examination. He makes a diagnosis and then he suggests a treatment plan. Each one of us needs to be open-minded and honest and self-critical in order to suppress and arrest this enemy within us. We need to take action against this enemy before we can effectively rally ourselves against any external enemy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows best. وَقُولُ خَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَقْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ وَبِحَمْدِكُمْ وَنَشَدُ وَنَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتُ وَنَسْتَقْفِرُكُ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. 
One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims. According to what I have brought, your hawa, your opinion or your desire or your feeling, your emotion, into accordance with what I have brought. So we know that the believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last day, it is their obligation to check themselves, control themselves, bring their opinions and bring their feelings and bring their emotions and bring their desires into accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet In the light of the present world circumstances and the many adverse situations that Muslims are facing every day, in so many places, one can rationalize and understand why our minds would focus upon the nations and or governments that are directly or indirectly responsible for perpetrating such adversity upon the Muslims. Of course, it's natural. It's natural for us to be preoccupied. It's natural for us to be concerned. It's natural for us to react to the enemies who are perpetrating this kind of adversity upon Muslims everywhere. As a reaction to, to these criminal acts against Muslims, we are seeing an equally blatant amount of criminal acts perpetrated by Muslims as reprisals from groups of frustrated and angry Muslims who believe that they must fight fire with fire. We see other Muslims marching, shouting, publicly protesting in an attempt to peacefully or in other ways bring attention to these horrendous and unrelenting acts of aggression upon Muslim people. They feel, and justifiably so, that this is the least that they can do in facing the onslaught of an obvious enemy. This social and political repression and
One, this enemy serves to aggravate and distort the relationship between Muslims even. And number two, this enemy serves to distort and undermine the Islamic message and the Muslim image to the non-Muslims. This enemy has several faces and this enemy has several features, some of which I want to discuss. Some of the characteristics and features of this enemy stem from lack of knowledge. That's number one. If we trace the history, the Islamic history, we'll find that immediately after the Prophet wasallam, there appeared some Muslims who, although they appeared to be muttaqi, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, it was mentioned about them that they prayed more than most other Muslims. They engaged in more ibadah. They recited more Quran. They were more fervent in their spirit and their nature. But over a gradual point of time, they misinterpreted some ayats of the Quran. And they misinterpreted some sayings of the Prophet wasallam. And through this misinterpretation, they began to cause aggravation among the Muslims. And eventually this aggravation led to not just blaming other Muslims, but it led to their pointing at other Muslims and calling Muslims kafirs. And inevitably, after that, it went to the furthest extreme where they started to make it halal to take the blood of other Muslims. How this happened? One simple thing, to their lack of knowledge and their misapplication of some of the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through some extreme behavior, another oppression has created a host of complex and unprecedented reactions and have led to the extreme behaviors of hatred and vindictiveness on, many, on the part of many Muslims. I do not personally justify these extreme behaviors on the part of Muslims, whomsoever they are, how justified they may seem, how noble their objectives may appear, how knowledgeable they may be. Because criminal actions and criminal reactions are both all criminal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor do I in any way or shape or form justify the criminal behaviors and aggressions which have provided these or prompted these reactions. What I do want to speak about uh, this morning is another enemy that in my estimation is equal if not greater in its threat and impact upon the Muslim and the Muslim society which is usually avoided in discussions and which is sometimes veiled by other emotional issues, the enemy within. This enemy is a veiled enemy. This enemy is an enemy that we don't look in the face, except if we look in the mirror. This enemy works from within the ummah and within the individual. And this enemy destroys the ibadah. And this enemy distorts the aqidah. And this enemy gradually displaces the energy and the direction of the in individual who has this enemy within. This enemy works from within the ummah and therefore its influence is double-edged and it is very blatant and it has a very serious psychosis attached to it.
Are there some sisters here? Good. So, my respected uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, um, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a manner which is uh, befitting his stature. And we remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his malaika, they send special salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us, all you who believe, you too should send salutations upon him with a sense of reverence and gratitude. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa fil alamin indika hamidu majid. Allahumma barak ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa fil alamin indika hamidu majid. After this, my brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to discuss today some issues relative to correcting our behavior, reforming ourselves. And I titled this presentation as The Enemy Within. Because many Muslims today, they are preoccupied with the enemies from without. And they are pointing the finger and they are blaming and they are analyzing and they are scheming and they are plotting and they are reacting to the enemies on the outside while they are subject and subordinate to the enemy within. And if we are unable to subdue the enemy within, it will not matter what our assessment is and what our efforts are to deal with the enemy from, out, from the outside. The enemy within is the unruly self, nafsi ammara. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, none of you can become a true believer until you bring your hawa into a court.